time that we had a, an actual competition based on it. So you know this uh, a simulator and uh, some people are, were already writing code. I don't know if it was only Japanese, if it was all more international. There were eight teams there. And I have to tell you, this workshop was basically, I don't know, the eight participants in that com uh, competition, five more people or six more people. We were very few. The room was all empty. There was like Dominique, there was, uh, of course, Iraki Kitano, Minoru, Peter, myself, Silvio Paradacci, and Enrico Pagello, and a few other people. What was remarkable in the, that time was the energy. You, you guys now, you know, I do have gray hair, hair. You all know me for many years. I was really young. We were all young. And the level of energy was beyond limit. We never thought that this was not going to be possible. We always thought, yeah, robot soccer, fantastic. And we were lucky enough to have in our group this Yoraki Kitano, who was actually really pushing this, and he happened to be the local chair of this conference in AI, each guy, which is this international, international joint conference in AI. And Kitano said that he was going to do the first RoboCup at each guy in 97 in Nagoya. So the interesting thing was that it was these circumstances that made it happen. We were very lucky also to have in our group people that were all problem solvers. <coughs> so I tell you something, many of you probably know this already, but I tell you again, which is this concept of having the, to have to decide what the leagues were about. We were having lunch in some uh, Japanese restaurant and literally we were trying to define what would these small, what would these leagues be? I had like small robots at Carnegie Mellon, we had this kind of like small robot. Dominic also wanted to be small robots. Kitano also had some small robots. And we said, oh, at least we have three teams here. Let's decide how two people in the world will be able to play this. And that's when we came up with this idea that the field of play was going to be a ping pong table. Everyone in the world will have a ping pong table. No, the, no need to invent anything new as a playing field. And then this ping, pong, this ping pong table, we would just put it on the floor and the robots would play. And we kind of guessed that there was height enough for a camera to be on top and looking at it. And in the meantime, in Noro, with his robot, like I mentioned to you, that could actually learn how to kick the ball, he kind of started thinking about the middle size. And then in Tsukinoda, uh, with his soccer server, started thinking about the simulation. And because there was a Tsuki, and because there was Minoru, and because there was Kitano, Dominic, and I, we started the small size, the simulation, and the middle size. It was not because someone said that RoboCup should have this. It was because we existed, these three kind of groups. And therefore, that's the thing that we thought at least we would participate. So that was what happened. And that's what, 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 how it was. Here is it took in that in 97. This is the winning team of the simulation. This is Hans Dieter Burkhardt, who became very, very influential also. He was not at the workshop, if I recall correctly. Was he? No. No, right? But he came to RoboCup and he won the simulation. And this is Silvia Koradecki, who you know, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry we missed to explain this award for those of you that are, don't know about this. Usually when we give the award, to a female grad student, we explained Sylvia passed away uh, about like, I believe, um, eight or nine years ago. And she was uh, a fantastic uh, uh, supporter of our uh, Robo Cup. And actually the chair in 99 was Sylvia. The winners of the middle size and of the small size, look at me, here I am, Peter, these two you probably know. Here is a team from USC. I don't think that we have any of them with us. So uh, Wei Min Chen and all these other uh, uh, team members, they won this uh, competition. They scored basically all the goals, either in their own goal or in the opponent's goal. No matter what, they were scoring goals independently <laughs> from where. It was very interesting because the localization was very poor. So they were happy either way. On one side or on the other, it didn't matter. So it was a very interesting kind of like world. And then we had here the farewell party with uh, Kitano. And this, around this time, 
is when, in fact, this came up. That is RoboCup, after each time, not before, came up with this concept of this by 2050, a team of soccer robots will defeat the World Cup champion human soccer team. So this became kind of our goal, and I'll show you a little bit of a move, a video of what is uh, 97 and now also 98 look like. This is already, this one here is 97, uh, oh, well, maybe 98 already. So, and these were the famous eyeballs, Sony, who uh, literally uh, started the whole field of robotics in this kind of like Lego robots, accessible to everyone. And here are the robots in 98 in Paris. And here is Andrew Price's robots in 97. Oh, this is 98 again. This yellow, lead, Andrew is here, right? There's Andrew. Andrew Price had these wonderful kind of like yellow circle, circles. The, 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 here they are. These guys were localizing by using cameras at seven meters high, right? Exactly. So very interesting, all these papers that you can read. But this was a hookup next seven idea. It's a must for us as a community, even for younger that started much later than us, to know this so that you actually know how this all started. So I feel very strongly about this. Uh, and then here is in 98, Dominique Yuho. There is something about 98, I chose this picture because there is something really nice. The trophies this year were really beautiful, but the trophies in Paris were the best ever. <laughs> I have them in my lab, and these are the best, the most beautiful cups that exist. So this is a challenge for Bordeaux next year. <laughs> what type of cups are we getting? Dominique, is that we are putting a lot of pressure here because these are gorgeous cups. If you actually Google, maybe you will have better pictures of them, but they were all, all colored, really beautiful. And here, of course, is Kitano, myself, Enrico, Sylvie in the back, Minoru, and, and, um, and Dominique. And then, we were not that many, we were a lot, but you know, somehow we fit all in some kind of field. This is Daniel Mulani, and I'm sure you recognize many of the other people. Again, Sylvie here. And this person here, who you may know, uh, is Astro Teller. And Astro Teller is the current kind of, like he calls himself the capital, captain of moonshots of Google X, but he's the director of Google X. He was with us at RoboCup. He was my student, my PhD student, but he actually did RoboCup with a very, very beautiful, creative approach, evolutionary computation uh, in 1998. So he was in Paris, and we, uh, I was with him recently, actually, in London at a conference called X, and we had a lot of fun remembering these days. So this is it. Now we go on, and I tell you, what is, was all this about? 97, 98, I'll go on in a second. So the beautiful thing was that we were just starting, and we immediately knew that this was a scientific kind of uh, endeavor. So we had the first RoboCup Symposium in 97, together with the actual competition. And again, I really, I mean, I really want you guys to, everyone should have in their lab all the proceedings of every RoboCup. And literally go through them and look how beautiful this is. I mean, we had overview papers. I'm sure you cannot follow, but it doesn't matter. It's overview papers and technical papers. These overview papers were in those days, uh, the physical challenge, the synthetic challenge. And then we had already team description papers. Team description papers in yeah. those days. And so the science, from day one, we knew that we cared about the science, the research, and the line what we were doing in the competition. When we will all be gone, these founders and everyone, and you will continue, don't forget this. Don't forget that it doesn't matter if you just win the competition for the sake of winning the competition. What matters is that you contribute to science, some kind of advancement, a better vision algorithm, a, a learning walk to learn algorithm based on neural nets now, or some sort of collaboration, or whatever some speech, some communication, you can, you know what was novel in your development, and it's your responsibility, it's your duty to actually publish it. Even if you like to uh, develop systems more than writing, 
find a way, find a way, give a talk, record, record the talk, and then someone transcribes it, maybe a computer will transcribe it for you, and publish it. Publish it, put it on archive. Nobody has to know if it's accepted or not accepted, but it's your responsibility to the rest of your, the world and to yourself. Otherwise, 10 years from now, you don't even know what you did that made you win that at-home team or that made you win that SPL team. So publish. And we did this consistently. Here, Kitano was the editor, and then uh, uh, 98 was Minoru and Kitano, 99 was myself, Enrico Bajal and Kitano, and since then, we have Peter Stone, Tucker Bolch, Gerard for 2000, and every single one of the years, we have this great kind of compilation of research that you need to be able to know what's there. So, also when you do your related work, go through these proceedings. It's the best resource to know what other people have done in robot, in robot software. So, the, this was the very beginning, 97, 98, and then 99, but let me tell you also that we grew and very much, very fast in these soccer leagues, the famous idols, which definitely were a delight to anyone, to all of us. I mean, I still have many idols in my lab, and every time I open these boxes and I see them there, my heart, like, oh my God, they're so cute, we love them all. You know, really, they were amazing, amazing. The nows are very cute, but the idols were the idols, I'm sorry. But anyway, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but now we have to, that's fine. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay, and so we have the small size, we have the middle size, we have the simulation, and we have the humanoids. And there we go. And there is something I'm not going to uh, show to you at all. But in a, in a, in a 2012, uh, Peter Stone and I put together a video that we submitted to Iris, Iris on the all the evolution of every single of the leagues of soccer only. I'll talk about the rest in a second. And we, we described all that had happened between 97 and 2012. This video is available off my webpage. I will leave that off your page too. I don't know. It's available, so if you go to our website, I think it's available also out of our RoboCup website. So as you see, the small size kept doing 2007. There are these multi-robot passes. This is the best, uh, uh, the best uh, goal in the small size. Pass, 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 and then chip kick. We have corner kicks and then forward. So this is the small size part. Uh, all sorts of like uh, motion. There was this major change in about 2003 when things became much faster with the Cornell team. There was a team for Cornell and the uh, Ralph Dendrea who ended up founding uh, the um, Tiva systems that uh, Amazon uses. Uh, basically, it was a mechanical, oh, there's Enterprise's uh, robots. I mean, these are beautiful kind of yellow robots. And then, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Ralph Dendrea uh, was able to change the small size lead to be much faster, much better mechanical robots. And then, again, the middle size had all this evolution in terms of actually controlling the ball, uh, making passes, being able to actually be very accurate, look at the kick strength. And they also did this mixed teams in which some of the teams were from one university, some from other. Really amazing. Italy had the first mixed team team. And then, uh, as you can see, 2006, it was ball passing and eventually a score. And then in 2007, they went to a much larger field and they kept uh, having like these, uh, then they removed the colors, then they had to do cooperation, and potentially they were able to uh, aim really well. Their games were much faster than before. And I'm just going to fast forward here a little bit. There were goalies, then we had the wonderful Ivos, uh, the four-legged robots, the swipe goal. Uh, we had all sorts of, look at them standing up by themselves, so cute. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, you, you, uh, you had this wonderful defense, and uh, we also had these uh, back kicks, we had these emergent cooperation, they were positioned in the right place, so it was not really a pass, but because they were so well positioned, then eventually you could, like, score, and we could celebrate. You know, this, this is actually 2002. So in 2002 in Osaka, uh, I'm sorry, in Fukuoka, it was a major accomplishment to have the robots be happy when they scored. 
Everybody loved this, and this is all due to one of my students undergrad at the time, Sonia Chernova, who did the first happy dance, and it was uh, since then very used. I, I, I don't know why the nouns don't celebrate when they score. They should, <laughs> but they don't. They ignore the whole thing. And the kid size too, Olivier, please have them celebrate one way or another. <laughs> So, and here there is, uh, the, and then of course we have the humanoid. The humanoid at the beginning had to do only with this penalty kick competition. No game, it was just can you score? And here the can you score without falling? Look how beautiful. And then we had these Darwin robots also, uh, with, that enabled us to do this first actual soccer game. <laughs> Look at that one. You have to put, you hold yourself so you don't fall and you kick with your leg. Amazing. Then it kept like falling down, 2006-2007. Teen size, look how beautiful these uh, teen size, kid size. And then in 2008-9, the only direction vision was abolished. And then we had the competition for teen size. <laughs> and eventually we had the throw-ins and basically uh, that's where we are in 2011. And as you see, there is a there is, that, there is this continuous improvement over time, and uh, we have all these memories. You sh we should be better at saving all these memories of these uh, many years, and there you go. <laughs> and then also 2007 was a very important year. We were in Atlanta, and we decided for the first time to have a competition between humans and the robots. And because we did not know if humans would go were going to be hurt or not hurt, we decided only the trustees could actually uh, play because we didn't want to be sued by some broken leg by a robot or, then, you know, or some kind of like, I don't know. So there has been a tradition. We did it last year again. I think it's getting a little bit more difficult. But, you know, we still have these humans beat the robots. If I'm not screaming on the side line saying, let the robots play, they will always not even let the robots touch the ball. But the robots are aiming really well. Okay, so if you have not seen this video, it was a lot of effort to put it together. It had to be less than five minutes. So it was a short video, well compressed, so it gives you a chance to, to appreciate where we are. Um, oops. Then we went to do a lot, all the other leaps, rescue at home, industrial or at work in those days, and then we had this RoboCup Junior. And the RoboCup Junior is a major kind of like a, enterprise by itself, which, which started with actually Betsy Clark and then uh, Amy Gucci and many other, for sure, but definitely these were like the pillars, and Amy is still one of the pillars of this RoboCup Junior, and that we really uh, very much uh, uh, want to push forward. This is a picture, actually, of RoboCup Junior in Dras, I believe, uh, if I'm correct, if uh, Gerard is here, but I think it is. So let me just, let, let's move on and let's spend the last uh, 10 minutes on uh, the future, or before we do the future, let me very fast go through this. You know, we have the, oh, I have to, before we go into the future, we have still uh, one more thing to say. So we have all these, so we have been, why did I make the, the effort of writing all of these? Is for you to appreciate the, 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 the variety of countries that we have been in. Uh, the variety of places, <coughs> so from Europe to actually uh, the Asias to, uh, to um, the US or the Americas, we have been trying to be everywhere to cover the community. So what are the keys, uh, the RoboCup key for success? So I'm going to enumerate a few things. Uh, there is the first key for success is the community. We are a community. I mean, in 2001, when we did the RoboCup in Seattle, I managed to have everyone come for a picture, the humans and the robots. We literally brought all the robots in the venue, middle size, small size, humanoids, everyone. And we took the, the I think the only picture we have with everyone, because it was always hard to do the same thing when we grew more and more. But so this community aspect, I tell you something. I was thinking last night like this. There is no other place in the world where I am, and I know so many faces. I'm telling you, even at CNU, I don't know anyone who's disappear. I know my colleagues. But here I tell you, I might not know the name of all of you, students, faculty, I might not know. 
but all the faces are familiar. So every time I come to Robocop, I feel at home. This is like home. Because all these people are my community. They all are engaged on this robot soccer problem. They're engaged on these autonomous robots. They're engaged on trying to make a difference for AI and robotics. And so you feel at home here. And it's a really good feeling, uh, this community feeling we have. Another key for success, so please continue this community, this, uh, this community kind of like uh, building. Another key for success is the fact that we do have this symposium with the engineering and the science and the novelty, all kind of like having the same value. You give best paper awards for engineering, best paper awards for science, best paper awards for uh, now sharing ideas. Uh, and it has been from day one. RoboCup 97, we had best paper awards for engineering and best paper awards for science. Appreciate both. Keep like uh, encouraging people to submit to the symposium and share their contributions. Then the third thing is this competition. And here I want to spend just one minute. Many of you know about the, this about me. The competition is phenomenal. But there are properties of this competition that we may want to keep for the success of RoboCup. Definitely the sharing of solutions, for sure. Definitely the discussion of how the things should be different the year after, these dynamic setups. The fact that it needs to be reachable for people. The idea of the ping pong table was only to make it reachable for anyone in the world, be it Brazil, be it Japan, be it Portugal, be it the US. We all have ping pong tables. The concept of reaching to everyone is always underlying, underlying these, uh, these uh, RoboCup. Then there is this thing about being excited. We all love to see the robots score goals. Uh, yesterday, watching the, 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 the game for the kids' size, it's always still the case that what people like to see, or the kids at least, is when the robots fall and they stand up bad again. There was a kid behind us that would only laugh when the robot fell. Uh, it fell down, we are all trying to make sure the robots don't fall. One day the robots don't fall, maybe nobody will find this exciting. So. Maybe we'll have to make them fall on purpose, who knows? <laughs> so it's interesting that it, there is this level of excitement that people have. And in fact, you cannot imagine in 2002, when our idols had the happy dance, everyone would come to see our games just to see the robots dance, you know? And it was five lines of terrorism. Up, 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 down, 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 down. <laughs> and it's still not, no, they were not excited by seeing the robots actually score a goal. They thought it was for granted, there's the goal. There's the ball, why would they not score? But being happy and making a happy dance, that was really what made the excitement, anyway. So another thing that I think that's a key for success, and here is where I say that you, guys, that you probably know me well, you need, we need all to be flexible. I know we have millions of rules. I know we struggle to have everything in the rules, how many minutes, how many these, how many that, da, da, da. for goodness sake, for goodness sake. I, the fights I have always with these rules when they are broken for reasonable things. I've seen once a team for being declared for fitting a game because it was not there at 3 p.m. sharp. They waited five more minutes and that's it. The team was out and the poor kid was vomiting in the bathroom and this rule didn't apply. So he could not come back and stop the game like a bit late because the rule said that it was only five minutes that you need to, to wait. For goodness sake, <coughs> please keep these being a flexible thing. A flexible thing, okay? So if you can keep that after I'm gone, please remember, be flexible and be inclusive. Inclusive in the sense not just gender or not just, uh, but everyone, everyone. Uh, universities is that have more or less uh, experience in robotics, if we can be inclusive, flexible, dynamic, and eventually uh, exciting, maybe we can keep uh, growing this way. But sometimes I fear the flexibility aspect, okay? So open your hearts and try to understand this. In terms of community, also it's interesting to know that we get older. So this is a picture, this is a, I'm sure I could take this picture with many people. This is a picture in 99, uh, Klaus, Peter, and myself. Oops, Patrick is actually at Google. And here is the same picture, picture yesterday. So we kind of like here. Okay, 
Organizational, we are extremely smart at organizing ourselves. We have trustees and sets, and then we have this concept of technical committees, organizing committees, and teams. Use this structure as best as you can to advance the state of RoboCop. We actually have tremendous value in this structure that enables people to reach out to everyone through technical committees, through organizing committees, all the way to eventually push the, the champions that they think are the best. And uh, the, the, here is a meeting of the trustees, and I'm going to rush through this, it doesn't really matter. But there is another thing which is research and public interest. I, I cannot tell you how much I remember with uh, the light. Eindhoven. <coughs> Eindhoven was one of the best ever RoboCups because the amount of people we have. So I'm going just to spend some time talking about, I don't have time to show you this, but I'm going to just spend some time going over this future. And there are 11 minutes on that clock. Maybe we don't have much time for questions, but we'll, you can talk with me. But I want to go through this. RoboCup, I wanted to have it. We should have it as a unified place for all robots out. If Google starts a robot soccer thing, if someone in Duke University starts a robot soccer thing, if a field is there with robot soccer, why don't we engage on unifying all of these and bring anyone that does a robot soccer to RoboCop? I really think we should aim at this. These are all ambitious goals. We have to do what Peter also, also mentioned, produce usable by others data. We now know how well our algorithms can learn from data. We have to invent new algorithms learn from data, and let others use our data. We have to be very ambitious with this thing about having RoboCup with teams 11 on 11. And if we go to 11 on 11 on anything, be it the kid size, be it the, 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 the small size, be it anything, it's impossible to think that a single university will have robots enough to support a team of 11 anything. So inevitably, we need to do research on the problem of having teams that are from different universities. And we are going to solve, solve one day, the 802.11 problem. So you do realize that, the, that these, these standards to have computers all connected to the Wi-Fi were invented at IEEE years ago, 802.11 or some couple of other standards that enable any computer to connect. We need to invent a standard for multi-robot coordination so that any robot that comes in, according to this, can share images, can share decision making, can share data. Okay, so uh, this robot platform independent AI, it's another goal. And then finally, also, I think I have two more. Uh, 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 this, this concept that after all, how come we are not generating uh, automated uh, assisting referees, coaches, commentators, tweeting, generation of our lights, everything, automatically. We have all the data, all the data, all the images, we even can listen to what people say. We have everything. We even have the code that the robots are running. So we can aim high and generate all of these automatically. If you did not see yet the automated referee in the small size, you need to see. I don't think the small size brags enough about that automated referee. The games at 2019 did not have human referees. It's a remarkable accomplishment, a remarkable accomplishment. So we need to escalate that to coaches, uh, anchors, and all of this. The last of these challenges is to respond to audience feedback. These robots don't hear people screaming and shouting. They don't, uh, they don't do anything. They are completely oblivious if they are winning, if they are losing, nothing. It cannot be for eternity like this. So one of these times we are going to have to create in these robots more about the perception part that is not just the task. But it includes the perception. Oh, the lights are too, uh, too, too, too weak. Oh, there's too much noise. I cannot, whatever. Or where, are my, where is my audience? So this is also one thing. And now finally, <coughs> let's aim uh, high. Uh, let's, uh, let's aim impact. We are a community that forms problem solvers, thinkers, and leaders. I beg you, do not all go to Google. Facebook, Amazon, uh, and Microsoft. If you could consider also hospitals, if you could consider also financial services, if you could consider construction, if you can consider like uh, architecture, the building blocks of society need your problem-solving skills, need your computing skills, 
need your thinking leadership skills. So when you think, where should I go? Think about going to a company that does things for the world. Did you ever notice that everything works like the, the toilets flush, the bridges don't fall, the nothing, the whole world, it's not just the recommendations on Amazon, for goodness sake. So it's not just searches of Google, many things need computing. Many things need computing. So think about the real world beyond our technical digital world and see if you have an interest or, or gain an interest. The second thing is that we have to understand that this AI and robotics is a very powerful revolution. The industrial revolution of the last century was very powerful too, but we are here playing a little bit with the fire. So it's very important for us to understand that this is very powerful. Look at elections, look at fake news, look at all sorts of things for which our science has mis has, is being misused. So we cannot do this. We have to be careful with the robots we produce. We have to be very careful about understanding all the aspects of good for society. So at RoboCup, we have a little bit of a taste of the whole world. The number of cultures here is enormous. We can, we need to build and learn about these values, ethics, peace, good, innovation, transparency, happiness, kindness, empathy, all these types of things. We can be a little microcosmos for that. To finish, I'm going to say that, uh, I'm going to tell you this, as you heard Simon's saying, that this future, after all, we are not spectators of the future, so we really are these uh, actors of the future. And therefore, it's our responsibility that we create AI and robotics, and I tell you, it's our responsibility, it's a call to humanity, to actually, to us in RoboCup, to create things that are actually of use to society. And also, J JFK said this very beautiful uh, comment about people getting out of work because of robotics, he said, well, if men have the talent to invent new machines that put men out of work, they have the talent to put those men back to work. So thank you very much. Oh, I have one final slide. So I actually think that uh, I am rewriting this goal. From what I understand of my these humans and AI, uh, of AI being so limited, I think that this is not about like, having a soccer team that fits the human team. This is about saying that by 2050, soccer robots will be part of the World Cup champion soccer team. Thanks. Questions. There's a roving mic out there, so please use it so everyone can hear your question. Yes, there's, there's a question here. Whoever's got the mic? Yes. Run, Stefan. <laughs> Just throw it. very inspiring talk. And um, you mentioned uh, soccer players, uh, robot, uh, expressing emotions at the end of the, of the, of the, of the game. And uh, I believe Herb Simon also worked on emotions and robots and wrote a seminal paper on that. Do you imagine um, social emotion signals being part of some of the tasks in terms of maybe not just soccer, but also mobile cup at home? And what do you think those could be? So this is a very good question. Of course, uh, we would like one day to have these uh, uh, creatures be more um, connecting with the humans. However, I also tell you one thing. If you have not seen the Sophia robot that looks like a person and talks like a person and so forth, I believe we should always keep a very clear distinction between what are humans and what are robots. When we'll have robots around, they better look like robots, they better like act like robots, like cats and dogs. I mean, the cats and dogs, we don't make them look like humans. 
So we will have cats, dogs, humans, and robots. And so I think they will have to have some level of emotion or some level of empathy or some level of ethics, but I don't think it's going to be the same kind of like uh, uh, exchange of eye contact that I have with someone I really care about or with, with someone I'm trying to help. So I hope and I'm sure that humans have some DNA, in their DNA something that is not reproducible in machines. Any other questions? I love your quote, uh, but I was wondering, because I remember in grass 2009, this incredible match between the robots and some people, uh, process, yes. I guess. So is there any roadmap or goal in which we start including people into the match? Yeah, very good question. So actually the question is about, we do play the trustees against the robot. But I tell you, you can ask the trustees. Many times I have made, uh, I told uh, Peter actually, go and play in the robot team. And I've been trying to have these mixed human and robots for a while. Of course, we have to eventually have the right black pants or some kind of way for the robots to know where we are. But it would be very nice if we start understanding, especially AI in general, that this is not about AI and humans. This is in fact about AI and humans together. So this is why I am rewriting these after 20 years of understanding how far we can push the field of AI and robotics within humans. Yeah, but the question is, when do we start? It's up to us to decide. Everything is okay. in our hands. Okay, so we probably have time for one more question. Another question? It's okay. Oh, yeah? Yes. And, and then, you know, Manuela will be here for a little while, all day, essentially. So, um, you know, call to her somewhere and, I mean, She's wound and up see, now. You won't be able to stop her from talking, so and sharing her ideas and. Okay, so uh, could you uh, uh, slide back to uh, the future that's in Italy? The future that I which uh, one? Yeah, yeah, oh, that's one? fine. And uh, so uh, in <coughs> the past item, I like to add uh, uh, the, the Rupaka forms uh, uh, before the problem is solved. Problem found a uh, finder. Oh. So, uh, so you also uh, uh, just we are using structure, but uh, we need to define every, uh, several programs, and uh, it is like a, a kind of the so uh, flexibility of the robot. And I like to hear about you. Uh, so, yeah. So unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you about JP Morgan, but I'm actually problem finding there. Uh, everything I've done at RoboCup is of use to this financial domain, whether you believe it or not. It's very similar. Uh, all the expertise I've gained doing robotics is of use to any kind of like uh, computing and human environment like financial services. Uh, so I think you're right that people need to understand that if they go to a bakery and they try to automate the bakery, or if they go to financial services, or if they go to an architect, or if they go anywhere, that they can formulate problems to be solved using our technologies and then solve them, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, that was amazing.